Narcabuse TV Network is now on the air on YouTube. Now, we wanted to do this, but we only wanted to do it with Susan E. Winter. That's just how we roll. We wanted to do this with Susan E. Winter for a reason. It's because you asked me to. <laughs> uh, beside, uh, I think it's a beautiful thing. Uh, our followers across all of our social media platforms wanted us to be on YouTube. We took a year, almost a year and a half, and now we're here. So I asked my followers, who do you want to see? Hands down, Susan won. Literally, hands down. They said Susan Winter, Susan E. Winter, or like I like to say behind the scenes, S-E-W. She sews everything together in your relationships. So here we are. Susan is going to be coming on in a moment and joining us. Uh, we have the most amazing guests across social media platforms. All right, I'm doing a few things here that makes it comfortable for me to get this show on. We're going to be dealing with narcissism, relationships, and recovery on Narc Abuse TV Network. You can find that to be the case uh, if you go to our Instagram page. We're giving uh, everybody a chance to find us and figure us out. This is a, as you can guess, a pilot show. We've already had two shows with uh, Susan uh, recently on Instagram, which means you get to hear and see Susan E. Winter right here, kicking it off for us on YouTube. need everyone if you by the way i see you over there i see everyone also on instagram i'm not forgetting you i see a few things uh i am not forgetting you at all uh, but i'm going to stick my head in over here so you can see you're going to get on instagram and you're going to be looking for susan you're going to find the audio portion of this show on instagram we will be broadcasting to two platforms social media platforms at the same time so i'm going to be grabbing my camera over here for Instagram and bringing it around. And we're going to be getting some things done over here for Instagram. All right, now we got everything set up. Susan has been in our green room waiting for us. We're going to get started. Uh, wave out to some of you who are there on Instagram. Instagram, Narc Abuse TV is on Instagram here on YouTube. Narc Abuse TV Network. Narcissism, relationships, and recovery. Let's make this happen. Narc Abuse TV Network, Susan E. Winter. Please go to Susan E. Winter on Instagram. You're going to need to get to Susan. That's what we're going to need to do. I think so. I see you over there on Instagram. But right now, YouTube has my attention because that's where Susan is. Knock, knock. Susan, you're out there somewhere? Hopefully, you're out there somewhere. Hey, everyone. There she is, everybody. The lady of the hour is here. Thank you, and Susan. And my <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know you got some jealousy. We just got through talking. Yeah, my daughter, she said, you look beautiful, Susan. And then she went, and I love your plant. <laughs> it's like, I, I think I know what's coming next in the studio um, of what Is we had. Love, in the yes. infatuation, or game? Yes. Because sometimes you don't know. And you had a bulk of questions 
when you looked at the through line of all the questions you were receiving that people wanted to know about, they wanted to know, are they experiencing something real? Are they being conned? Is what they're feeling real love or is it just, you know, are they whipped up in the height of the moment? So they, they don't really know where they're, where they're at. So this is what we want to answer today. If okay. We can. Yeah. And that rebound that, relationships. If a person gets a, a rebound relationship, how can they tell whether it's love infatuation or are they just being played by someone who sees them vulnerable? Oh, so they're the ones who feel that they have Earth. found themselves in a rebound. Yes. You don't know. I, I mean, don't you wish if I had a formula that I could espouse to everybody right here, nobody would have any heartache because they'd know from day one. But we learn through trial and error and you have to proceed with caution and hopeful optimism. If you feel that you're vulnerable and you're not as secure as normal, just beware of entering anything. Make sure that they're not love bombing you, that they're not forcing the pace. And also, you know, if somebody tells you they love you in the first three or four weeks, that's not love. So, you, you know, they may feel that that's, they, they may think in the moment that those words mean something, mm -hmm. but it's not real love as we know love. Uh, if you're the vulnerable the person who finds yourself with somebody, then you may not know in the very beginning that they are longing for their mate. It isn't until they start to become attached to you and find an internal conflict within themselves that they will then tell you, I'm sorry, I can't do this. Sometimes people enter with all good intentions and they really don't know themselves. If, if, um, if a person finds themselves in a situation in which they have been desiring, craving, love in a relationship, in they they meet someone is it possible that they want love so strongly and so bad that they begin to ignore things that lets them know that this is not going to work absolutely we all do that's those are red flags we tend to blow through them when we want to create something when we want love oftentimes we will see what we want to see but you know when you think about it that's the bait that love uses to get you in the door. If you knew from day one, the problems you're gonna experience with this mate in 10 years, you might not enter the relationship. But what happens is we have this idyllic honeymoon phase where we see the best of the person and the person is showing up as their best self. What's not to like? We notice they snapped at the waiter, but we're gonna forget it. We notice they argued about their ex-girlfriend who was horrible, but we're going to just ignore it because they're so cute and they want us and they love us and we need somebody and we're scared of being alone. So we're just going to ignore it until it becomes so big that we can't ignore. It. If, if, if a person is looking for love and all they've ever experienced is failure, how can they then know whether it's love or infatu infatuation when they, when they experience it? It's a really deep question, and that's that's a really good point, Paxton, because you don't know. You know what you know until you know more. I in, in Allowing Magnificence, and I only use this because those who have read it will know, but that, that's a book I wrote. I talk about a friend of mine who did not know what love was like. She was a very loving person, but she did not know what it was like to be loved. She only knew... Um, that when she was sick, hmm. her parents paid a little bit more attention to her, which felt like love. So do you have any idea her pattern as an adult to get attention? And she said, how do you create a loving relationship if you don't even know what that looks like? And so, mo mo I'm sorry, please go ahead, Susan. No, no, go ahead and ask your question. You know, most, most people don't have a loving relationship that they were able to have a model of. Yeah. So and if we don't, what do you do, right? If we don't have a working model of what love is like, we take the best example, even if it's a friendship, even if it's something we've seen in the outside world, and we try to create that as our first impression. 
imagine what you want to experience. And you have to have read something in a book or seen something in a movie or TV that looks like something you want. The distance between believing that you can get that and where you are today is incremental experiential moments right. in your life. You've just got to kind of grow into the belief that you can have it, right? So start with exterior models from other people. Uh, there is a, a question. Let's see. What do we have here on Instagram? Somebody's saying sometimes a person sees them, but many believe, talking about the red flags, that being kind and loving will override that and that the person will see it and understand that uh, the person is genuinely thinking of them and loves them, but that they can kind of love them, love those red flags away. Is, is that okay. possible? Okay. So they're, they're, this is perfect. Um, it, it, this, is a, this is more of a philosophical question. Can your love heal them? You know, the vehicle of romance, dating and relationships is indeed transformational. Okay, it can be something where we learn greater depths of love within ourselves. But can your love fix somebody? Not if they don't want to be fixed. Can your love create, take a narcissist and make them a good person? No, the default is the default. So the best you can do is if they're frightened or scared or have trust issues, you can be consistent to show that it's a safe place. You know, it's one thing if they're a wounded animal and they're scared, yeah. then consistent love could, could turn out to be something where they begin to trust you, relax, and you could have a functional relationship. But your love, even though theoretically it seems like your love should be able to heal them, right? if, if they're not doing the work, yeah. they'll abuse it. Yeah. Yeah, they can do it wherever you like if you want to if you want to do YouTube. I see a lot of you rolling in. Everyone saying hi on Instagram. Thank you. Oh, That's Amber up. Legato, hi, and Alice, how are you doing? Yeah. I see come you. On, yep. Come on over to YouTube if you if you can. Uh put it on your phone, uh get to your laptop, whatever you like to do, Susan. Functional and optimal. Um M -E. you know, M E, we're both learning how to do it here. And and honestly, Paxton is much braver than I am. I should have been doing premier three years ago. My friend Andy Lyons is a pro. She's got graphics flying in. I'm like, yep. oh my God. Uh, yeah. You know, well, I tell you what, we, we, you and I are gonna be learning this together because we, we well, play yeah. with this. Listen, you should have seen me. I'm like a kid in a candy store playing with this thing, and I went like, Man, I should have been doing this a long time ago. Um, okay, so uh, Emmy is here. Gloria, of course, I agree with you much better on YouTube to, to watch this. Um, but uh, functional, optimal. How can you tell the difference when you meet somebody, what you're dealing with? Because what if the guy's lazy? I mean, what? I'm just saying there's so much lazy that pops in my head as a dad. Lazy normally shows up later if they're going to be trying to act like a boyfriend. My girlfriend and a nice guy. Well, he yeah. got lazy. He got comfortable really quickly. And by month four, he just stopped working at it. There are wow. some people that are lazy in the very beginning. They chat you up and then they drop you online. So it just depends. Yeah. You know, dating nowadays is not that easy. And that's mm -hmm. why we're here to try and answer some questions that people have so that they can decipher and start to learn the patterns of what appears to be somebody who's truly interested what somebody who's playing with me, oh boy, this one's scary. This one's way too interested. I, there's something wrong here. So, yeah. we're, you know, it's too hot, too cold, or it's just right, right? Okay. So it, it, the possibility is there that somebody could change. Do you see Emmy has a question for us there? Your question was if someone, here, let's just do this. Can you see it there, Susan? Mm -hmm. okay. Your question was if someone sees. Abuse, I think she's saying. Abuse, I think that is, and stays because of the attention and love deficit. And I said, some people believe with their love, they can change their ways. Yeah, that's a really nice philosophy. You, you will truly suffer if you are with an abusive person. You know, there are people, sociopathic people, narcissists, the better you are, the more they use it against you and use it to their benefit. That's not to say that, I, I, I just want people to be realistic here in, in the deepest spiritual sense, great. You're doing a great job showing up as an A plus human being and loving the unlovable. 
excellent. If you're a human being trying to survive and not have chaos and drama and emotional right. pain and discomfort, right. you might want to choose somebody that yeah. isn't such heavy lifting. Remember, even when you get in a relationship, you need to have that person to have a skill set to make it valuable to you. And you want mutual love and affection and appreciation. Why are you doing all the Florence Nightingale work? Why? Why would somebody want to do that? To have a project? Then they really need to find their life passion instead of working it out through a person. I mean, that's a little, I mean, I'm being a little hard this time, but. No, but that, I, thought, no. I thought my love could heal somebody. Hell no. Uh, 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 uh. Is that, is that, that's normal though. I think all of us have had that. I, well, I think so. You know, the I think savior everyone, complex, right? The savior complex. Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. And when a person feels like they can save someone else, they feel that they can move that person to love the same way they're loving. But not everyone, especially nowadays, wants to move in that direction. They, has it seemed like from the work that you do, you're running into more people who are experiencing meeting takers instead of givers? Well, yes, but people contact me out of discontent. The person they love, it's not working out with them. They want it to be better. That's normally what it is. Or they're suffering a breakup and they want to recover. So they're trying to gain their balance. And normally it's a question of, is there hope? Which means what we're talking about is, is this person that I have in my life, are they someone that I should keep investing in? Is there a hope of a better, more functional relationship? Or should I bail? What's the deal here? What am I looking at? What do I have? If I have some issues, are they something that I can fix can they fix them? That's what it comes down to. When someone is dealing with uh, a player, uh, male or female, but I want to lean into the guys <laughs> as being players. If, if a guy's a player, what's his ultimate goal? It's obvious not to be in a long-term relationship. Is it conquest? Yeah, I mean... You know, you're a guy. I think that that's, you know, sexual conquest, but it's power and it's oh, control. Okay. And it's um, imagine having somebody under your spell. How incredible you feel. Mm -hmm. You know, they program you. First, it's like love bombing, all the attention, all the, oh my God, it's then they futurize, they get you trapped in the dream, which is my word for. They have you believing a fantasy that you want to believe and they fill in all the colors for you. So you're like, oh my God, it's really gonna happen. I've, I think I've really found the one. Oh my goodness, this is it. And they, they build on that until you're so hooked. Then they start the pulling away to make you an addict, you know, to make you like craving them. And so you wait around by the phone or you wait this weekend hoping they're gonna see you and then they don't call. And then you, you know, you'd give anything to see them for five minutes and you become their creature. So um, it's about control, it's about winning, and it's really about low self-esteem on their part. Probably the most fragile egos of anybody I've known are the players. They want to play at the game of love and never get hurt. They want you to be totally under their spell so that they will never feel that they're under yours. So they're intimidated by the people that they love, even though you appear to think you're the weak one, you know, they can't play this game without your cooperation. They're really yeah. insecure then, based upon what you just described. I, there. In my experience, because I, I did this for six years, I mean, I, I had nothing to tell people. I had long-term, decade-long living with somebody. A short-term relationship for me was like four years. So I had nothing to say to anybody that was going through the revolving door of dating in Manhattan. What am I going to say to my girlfriends? I don't, I don't even know what they're dealing with here because I did everything differently. So I involved myself with players. Willingly and, willingly uh, and knowingly. Abs I had to get the recon. I, I you, knew seriously. That, you, know, Are you yeah. brave soul brave soul. Okay. Well, and I and I I'm not a hookup girl, so it was really I, I mean, I got really dented by it. It was a lot of wounds. I mean I I did a lot of journaling, I did a lot of writing, but I got a lot of information. Um, and I realized that um, they're more terrified of love than you are for loving them. I know? am just surprised by that. It seems like they've become really accustomed to being 
the person in charge of love. So they seem like they would be the master at maneuvering, but they really are afraid of the love that, for example, if I was a player, I'm essentially afraid of the love you would be giving me because I would lose power. Is that? Well, you're afraid to feel love yourself. Feel it. Okay. So now I dealt with people that were not narcissists. Okay. I dealt with guys that basically had no skill set. They were half my age, didn't want a relationship, you know, just were player, player, player. They'd already been with women in the hundreds and they were only in their twenties. So I dealt with everything was against me. Could I affect a change in this person? And you've got to realize I came in as me. So I had a few more, how do I say? I had more skills than some people who would Mm -hmm. half my age that just haven't had the time to figure out human beings. And I drew in some guys that were, um, you know, they just, they had not awakened to love yet. They were closed. You know, I was callous when I was a teenager. I broke hearts. I didn't know. I didn't know what love was. You don't really know what love is till you have your heart broken. And then you're like, oh, this is what it feels like. Oh, now I know. So sometimes that has to happen. When you experience that, you now have a record of it. Can you see it in others when they're going through it? Oh, yeah. I mean, and I can feel for them, too. Absolutely. Because I've been there. There is no there is no positive resolution when someone's dealing with a player. Well, see, if you're I'm going to say, let's say you're a woman trying to date a player. OK, you think you're special and you are as a human. You think that you're special to them. Right. That's, that's the delusion. Right. You think that somehow what you got going on is going to make them go, oh, my God, I can't believe I missed this. Ta-da! Oh, she's the one. And that's your hook because that's not going to happen. And if you can withstand the ride and every game that's played, you're going to come back to the same place. You know, in TV movies, we see it happen like she plays hard to get and she plays him and then he falls in love with her. But that's TV movies. For most people out there dating, dating a player, he has an agenda. He, he either wants to capture your heart, to feel good, to have control. Um, he, maybe he's opportunistic. Maybe he's trying to get money out of you. I, opportunity, I don't know what it is. Um, but, you know, the reason that you get caught is that you believe that you're going to win. And, and it's a game. Then it becomes an ego game of staying in because you want to win. It becomes an ego game. Not, of course, the player, the player is doing that anyhow, but it becomes an ego game for the female to stay in or to walk away from it. Okay, so now I have this question for you. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so I want to ask you something so bad, but I just can't ask you. Okay, I could ask you. Can you remember the uh, the first attempt a guy made to try to kiss you? (laughs) 